Good evening, you're watching SGTV News. Coming up, top of the class, money for a new classroom in East Hull. Where's the mayor? This week, Tony Howard, mayor of Mablethorpe. And I'll be talking to local author Alistair Wilkinson about this week's regional press. Welcome to SGTV News. I'm Hugh Riches. First of all, it's over to Dan Kemp for the news headlines. Hello there. The Prime Minister and Chancellor announced £1.5 million worth of funding to help bring the Turner Prize to Hull in City of Culture year. David Cameron and George Osborne made the announcement in Leeds as they set out their plans to increase the size of the Yorkshire and Humber economy by £13 billion by 2030. £1 million of the funding will go towards refurbishing the Ferrant Art Gallery, with a further half a million pounds given to Hall's Culture Company for staging the prestigious art prize. Martin Green, chief executive of the Culture Company, said it was a vote of confidence for the city and will be the catalyst for regeneration. Whilst in Yorkshire, George Osborne also announced the construction of a new technical college in Hull. It will be for students aged 14 to 19 and will be dedicated to training the engineers of the future, with the aim of aiding young people to thrive in the digital economy. Grimsby is set to join places such as Hull and Dundee in getting their own Monopoly board. Monopoly Grimsby Edition will feature various iconic sites for sale from around the town and local area, which local people can vote for online until the 31st of May. Sites earmarked so far range from the Dock Tower to the Leaking Boot statue. Rob Osborne, Monopoly Development Director, described how Grimsby came to get its own board. I think a particular television show and a forthcoming movie helped to uh, put, it, put Grimsby on our radar. Uh, there's been some negative press. We feel that the charm of the town is a lot better than what's being given at the moment. So for us, it's a great place to come. We came and done a, a reconnaissance mission, fell in love with the people, fell in love with the fish and chips, which is always great, and lots of different things related to heritage. I think it's important to recognise places throughout history of Britain that have been extremely important to the development. East Riding of Yorkshire Council have improved the Conservative Council's budget for the forthcoming four-year period. The motion was voted 51 in favour and six against. It will see the council make another £30 million worth in savings in the region, whilst putting up council tax by 2%. The budget's been set uh, once again um, with uh, very little fuss, really. Uh, I think that's, the way, like, that's how we like to deal with things here. It's got a council tax freeze and there's actually no reductions in services, so we're particularly pleased with that, considering that all the reductions we have to make, along with every other local authority in the country. And finally, paving slabs in Grimsby Town Centre, dubbed crazy paving by residents, are to be relayed next week. And that's all for now. For most children, lunchtime is the highlight of the school day, but one group of pupils in East Hull has been forced to dine in their own classroom. It causes delays and disruption to their education, and the local authority has offered to contribute towards a new room. But the school must raise £40,000 towards the cost. And the clock is ticking. Students now have just two weeks until the offer expires. And so far, they've only got £3,000. Dan Kemp has more. Perhaps as a temporary measure, it wouldn't be so bad. But students here at Paul Primary School have been learning in the dinner hall permanently. It's only a hall at the moment and we're constantly having to move the tables for lunchtime and all that. So it's quite, it takes away a bit of our lunchtime. I think we're missing, um, missing out uh, quite a lot of learning time because considering we have to move from one end of the school to the other just to be learning that way, so like, two minutes of our learning time. The East Riding of Yorkshire Council have offered to contribute three quarters of the approximate £160,000 needed for the new room, but it's left the school with £40,000 to raise in just two weeks. So far they've amounted just over £3,000 and time is running out. In the next two weeks they've got several events planned, including a welly walk and a car boot sale, both of which take place over the coming weekend. School Governor Diane Davis believes the school now desperately needs to expand. We've had various extensions over the years, but we've now reached the point where the school is a victim of its own success and it needs more room. We need a new classroom. On a typical day, they start with assembly in the hall. The whole school dispersed to the classrooms. Class 3 stays where it is. Desks have to be rearranged and they settle down to teaching. Come lunchtime, Class 3 has to move from that classroom, take all the books, and move out and go into the IT suite, which is where we are now. 
and they can work on the computers for that period while the hall is prepared for lunch. In a statement, the East Riding of Yorkshire Council have said, we are currently awaiting an announcement from the government on how much school's capital will be allocated for 2015 and 16 and future years. We understand that this is in the latter stages of preparation and that we will receive the information soon. We have included a bid of £120,000 for Paul Primary in the capital appraisal process, but this is dependent on the allocation we receive. And the current situation of classes being taken into the IT suite isn't ideal. Sometimes we have to go into groups of two and there isn't enough chairs in here so then people are walking out and in when people need to go to the chair and then people from that corner or something or that side of the room are just walking across and it's hard to get to that area. It takes us a while to settle down and then we don't have the amount of chairs that we need so we have to get chairs and then there isn't enough computers so we have to go get the laptops and everything like that. You're watching SGTV News. A little later, we follow the Mayor of Mablethorpe, Tony Howard. And we'll also have Dan Kemp with the sport. Teacher, writer, poet of the beautiful game, novelist and literary guru, I'm joined for the papers by my old friend and colleague, Alistair Wilkinson. Al, thanks very much for coming in. Thank you, Hugh. Before we start having a look at the papers, maybe you'd prefer me to start talking about your book. <laughs> it certainly uh, would. Uh, uh, that's the thing I'm interested in, certainly, Hugh, yes. Suspended. It's, uh, and it's, uh, I guess there's a clue uh, in the fact that it's got a picture of uh, the Humber Suspension Bridge on the cover of it. That's right, yes. Uh, tell me what it's about. <clears throat> so, uh, it's 2007, uh, the summer of 2007. And um, it was the summer of the first time that we all started experiencing all those floods again. And there's a special cause for the floods that goes all the way back in the sense of the story to 1990 when something happened in a in a fictional version of Humberside called the splash when something yes landed in the Humber right no one knows what it was okay but something landed in the Humber and the whole of the South Bank was flooded basically the uh, South Bank flooded with another North. I hate to edit you, Alistair. No, that's if absolutely the South fine. Bank flooded, the North Bank would have flooded. I, your story. It, it, well, well, no, it's my story. That's right. But that's to, to do with angle of impact and things like that. Obviously, there was some damage to the North Bank as well. You've done the trigonometry. Generally, I've done the trigonometry on this. Yes, there was some damage to the North Bank, but it was the South Bank that took the brunt of it mainly. Okay. Fast forward 17 years to 2007, and this fictional Humberside has basically become the Roswell of Europe, while people are trying to decide exactly what it was that caused this splash. Local entrepreneurs have taken advantage of this and created something called Splashland, which is now the most successful theme park in Britain. Right. So suddenly, the South Bank of Humberside is one of the most popular tourist attractions in Britain. So there's a sort of That's element of Jurassic Park meets um, tsunami here, is there? Um, with, I suppose a, with, you could look at it With like a little that. bit of alien invasion. Uh, well, well... Uh, I wouldn't want to give anything away. We don't know what caused the splash. At the start of the story, we're undecided. But certainly people have taken advantage of that. And in the middle of all that, we've got two characters, James and Barbara, who are both in between things in their lives. They're both, if you like, suspended, much like the bridge. Oh, that's clever, Al. That's very clever. I thought so, too. Thank you. And, um, and they meet. Turns out they were old friends at school. And then they meet again. And they meet some of their other old friends from school. And they get together. And things start to go wrong. Because ever since the splash, there have been mysterious deaths in Humberside. People just die. No one really knows why. And the numbers of deaths are very much clustered around the splash itself and then in the summer of 2007. So something's happening. I think and the you're, I dogs. Think, I think aren't you're writing a sequel as you're going along. No, 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 no. I promise you, this is just the setup. For I the suspect of you, it. you wrote the blurb on the back yourself, but it's, wor I did, it's yes. well worth reading out. Oh, uh, thank you. James, Barbara, and Tilda need something new in their lives, something exciting, and the June of 2007 promised much. But dealing with new kitchens, conspiracy theories of aliens and monsters, and a missing Tilda wasn't what they had in mind. The three of them, along with a motley crew of local workers, are going to have the time of their lives. But odd dogs, hidden scientists, and an angry plumber are threatening to ruin their summer and stop them from saving the world. There's a mixture of genres here. Uh, there certainly is. There certainly is. The, the, the key genre, uh, I like to think, is it's, it's a horror comedy, basically. But there's uh, a generous dose of, of sort of fantasy sci-fi 
And there is a, a central romantic comedy in there as well. Excellent. OK. How long did it take you to write? Well, that's a, a, a strange story because it's been an ongoing project of mine for seven years, which obviously is a long time. The first draft took about 18 months and then I just left it alone. I'd go back to it every 18 months or maybe once a year, have another look at it, maybe try and beg some other friends to read it again. Be, oh, that thing again, that thing again. Is it and useful then, to get friends to read it and, oh, very, and, very and correct the asinine errors you made in the first two chapters? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Hugh, that's right. You, you did read it for me several years ago and said that the, the two chapters repeat themselves. They, they no longer do. Um, but certainly that is, a, that is very true. When you are a writer when you are trying to write and you're on your own you really have your own opinion and it, it's okay sitting there trying to laugh at your own jokes but in the end it's you do need to, ask not to laugh it, at your own jokes in your case I thank you very much it. it's uh, you do need someone else to read it and just tell you how bad it is and then you have to go and write it again <laughs> could you uh, just tell me uh, how can people get their hands on this book how much does it cost where, they, where can they find it okay so it's available as both uh, an ebook and as a paperback copy as well. If you simply a search engine of your choice, type in Suspended Alistair Wilkinson. There are lots of different options for buying it. It's one ninety nine for the ebook, available from Excellent. lots of different Value. vendors, and seven ninety nine for the paperback. For the solid thing. For the Alistair, solid thing. Thanks very much. Well done for that. We must turn to the newspapers now. Okay. Oh, it's all right. You don't have to take it back immediately. Uh, <laughs> first story that you found here. Uh, mm -hmm. we, I think it was one over there about about well, a liter suitably literary subject. A about suitably the literary subject. This is about um, improving. Uh, the the word is improving how libraries are being run, and the North Lincolnshire County Council wants to do similar to what the North East Lincolnshire County Council has done, which is change library services into what they're calling um, community hubs. Now. My, I have no problem at all with libraries being turned into community hubs at all. I'm, I'm a big fan of libraries. If it wasn't for libraries, we, as a civilization, we wouldn't be where we are today. True. Let alone where we are today as a community. But this idea of these community hubs being run by volunteers, for me, I, I just can't agree with that. I think if you want it, to turn something into a hub and make it this important central part of our community, then it needs properly trained but people is to run the it. the reason that the libraries are closing or can't be run with professionals is because so few people are using the libraries that the footfall, the demand for the libraries is so small that the councils don't think it's worth paying for. Okay, and I understand that and that's certainly part of the argument about turning it into these community hubs so that we can have all these things, we can have uh, the internet, we can have a coffee bar, we can have meeting rooms. But, but why I can can't get, we have I can those? look at my phone if I want the internet and I can go and have a cup of coffee if I want a coffee bar. Yeah, I know you can. So why would, um, why would a community hub uh, run by volunteers rather than people who actually know what they're doing? We'll come back to that. Okay then, okay, that's fine. Chain, 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 chain of fools. No, here, no fool here though. We talk to Tony Howard, Mayor of Mablethorpe, for Where's the Mayor? On Saturday, I will be visiting the uh, pantomime in Mablethorpe, where the new Maltby players are putting on uh, Babes in the Wood at Leicester Children's Holiday Centre uh, on Quebec Road in Mablethorpe. Um, looking forward to that immensely. Um, later on, uh, on Wednesday, I've got a meeting with uh, our town clerk. Uh, we've got uh, several projects uh, on the go at the moment that I just need to get an update with. Um, the most exciting one of those is the youth engagement uh, that we're going through at the moment, where we've got um, three groups of uh, youngsters who've come forward with projects um, which they're hoping to deliver in the town, which should help make the, the town look uh, more interesting to our visitors. Um, I also need to have a, a meeting sometime uh, during next week uh, with the Vicar of St Mary's, uh, that's Peter Liley, uh, about my upcoming civic service, which is taking place in, in March. But um, the time's drawing ever closer, we need to get the details finalised. I'm still here with Alistair Wilkinson uh, to talk about the newspapers. Al, you found another story. You've got a book called Suspended with a picture of the Humber Bridge on it, and you found a story that seems to be advertising your work. Uh, well, uh, that, that is a, a, nice, May I? a nice little added bonus there. Yes, that's right. So, Dad's horror plunge after zip wire collapse. They set up a zip wire from the North Tower of the Humber Bridge to the foreshore, which I've walked across the Humber Bridge many, many times. I, I grew up near Barton, and we used to go at night. Like, you know, just walk across, just to laugh a bit. And it is a long way down. I mean, for one thing, there's no way I would do that zip wire. But Mr. Acton decided that he would do the zip wire. And good luck to him. I'm sure it would be fantastic. But it went wrong. The zip wire went slack. 
And as he got to the landing stage, he smashed his ankle, gashed it open really, really severely, and smashed his hip as well. Apparently this is in front of his own children. And part of what, one of the reasons why it went wrong is apparently the landing stage itself shifted because the tide came in much quicker than he expected. The tide was faster than they expected? A apparently so, yes. Fickle the, uh, old tide, unpredictable old tide, beast, yeah. isn't it? It is, yeah. We haven't been looking at the Humber tides for many years, I'm sure. It, it could have been a lot worse, though. I mean, that's a very, very steep and long drop on a, on a zip wire, on one of those it death slide things really, on the top of the tower. Really, really is. I mean, it must have been a lot of fun, and well, until he got to the bottom. Well, why was he doing it? Or have you just answered I, I, your own I think, question? Uh, no, he was doing it for fun, I believe. He, he didn't know it was going to go on. He got there, saw it, and said, I'm going to have a go at that. Would you do it? No. No chance. I'd <laughs> love it. I think it would be absolutely fantastic. I'd love to do that. <laughs> what else have you got? What else have we got? Here we go. Um, this is, again, uh, I suppose I'll get another plug for my book here, because this feels well, quite... Let's stop this plugging feels the book quite now. We've done enough of that. This one. This one feels quite sci-fi. So Pocklington's Bakery is the first solar-powered bakery in the country. Um, they've, they've installed 600 solar panels and now, um, well, all of their ovens, I assume, are being run on renewable energy, which is fantastic. Although I would say, looking at that picture, it doesn't look that practical from the amount of room you need for the panels. Uh, yeah, there's a l vast acreage yeah. of sun panels there uh, to heat what are presumably, pres presumably quite small ovens. I mean, that's, that's you, know, well, I mean, you can get something of the scale from quite a small photograph. Yeah, uh, well, but I mean, Parkington's is a big bakery, for, for, well, locally big at least, but, but yeah, it does uh, look a bit... It's, uh, we, don't, we don't have the sort of weather where you can just leave your your dough out in the sun. I mean, in some countries you can make bread <laughs> just by, by natural sunlight. You don't need to enhance it. I'm not sure it we've got the kind it. of weather that actually does solar power. Or magnified. <laughs> Have you tasted Pocklington's uh, Bakery's bread? Uh, I do. I, I enjoy their, their buns, and I must admit I'm a fan of their sausage rolls. And well. does it taste of sunshine? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> what further? What further? So if we have a look now then at um, the Skegness standard, which uh, this primary school yes. in Skegness is so fed up with people parking right outside the gates and on the zigzag lines, you know, basically breaking the law where they shouldn't be parking, that they're going to create bollards actually shaped like children in an effort to remind drivers exactly why it is that you aren't allowed to park directly out of a school, which is because it's dangerous. The, um, uh, the, the the, this has got quite a lot of local coverage already. Mm -hmm. uh, rival and uh, not necessarily as accurate television stations have been talking about this. Uh, and the bollards do, uh, that look like children mm -hmm. are terrifying. They, yes. look, they look like, is it the midwitch cuckoos? Yeah, they? yeah, something like Doctor Who. Yeah. They're awful. <laughs> they, you expect them all to sort of turn in synchronisation and fire laser guns at you. Or which would like be fantastic, which, yeah. For would some be fantastic, would it? it? Well, it might be quite good for people who do park outside schools. Why not? Uh, it does have the demerit, though, that once people get used to seeing the children, the artificial children, <laughs> knowing that they're artificial, then they'll mistake a real child running out into the road for a, a, a bollard. And uh, it may have They'd its psychological advantages, but it also has its psychological disadvantages. They'll be it? fine. Real children are snottier. They're snottier, are they? That's how you tell. Okay. <laughs> We've got time for a few more stories. Time for a few more stories. So, shopkeepers in Bridlington are saying no more to supermarkets. They are just, and certainly I think we can all understand this, is this frustration, that we've had all the out of town and massive complexes being set up by those big three supermarkets, and now they're struggling because what are closer to being high street food stores in the Littles and the Aldis, the discount supermarket chains, are now setting up and they're taking even more customer away from local shops. This is a story, this, uh, this one's in, uh, in, uh, in the, on north of the river, but the same issue is going on all over the region. I know mm. in Louth there's a big uh, row in Lincolnshire yeah. about the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if people want to go and uh, get their food for less money at a bigger shop, uh, why shouldn't they? Yeah, uh, well that is the thing, I, I, as much as I do sympathise with shopkeepers. It, it does seem to be, I mean, I must admit, do I use the discount supermarkets? I, I would yes, imagine I that do. you do. I do, yes. Uh, there's one more story that I'd like to just get, get mm -hmm. in here, which is a, which North, is a good one. Yes, it, uh, it's a, it, a lovely story. It fascinates me as a, as a historian. This is in the Scunthorpe Telegraph. Mm -hmm. uh, Norse, artef Norse artifacts discovered locally declared treasure. Uh, it's a, a little coin or a medallion uh, that was just found to be Viking. Um, and the people who declared it treasure said that it was, um, uh, so there's a phrase in here that they've used which I thought was a, a little bit unfair to the beautiful Norse artist. Uh -huh. uh, it, it, it was a, a badly battered and shoddily made piece. 
Uh, I think it's a little rough of a 20... 21st century curator to criticise an ancient It does work. really. It's been in the ground for a thousand years. Yeah. Alistair, thank you very much. Thank you. And now over to Dan Kemp for the sport. We'll start with the upcoming weekend's football fixtures. Hull City travel to the Etihad Stadium where they'll face Manchester City. The Tigers are still looking for that elusive victory as Steve Bruce's side are now without a win in four. In League Two, Scunthorpe United host Oldham Athletic at Glanford Park. The Iron are in buoyant mood after their 4-1 win last weekend at Leighton Orient and we'll hear from their boss Mark Robbins in a moment. After two recent postponements, Grimsby Town are hoping to get their season back on track at Forest Green. The fourth versus fifth place game sees the Mariners sit six points ahead of their opposition, a gap that could be halved if they suffer defeat. And North Ferriby United face Ebbsfleet United at Church Road, hoping to pull on their FA Trophy journey and progress to the fifth round. Now back to Mark Robbins, and he's been bemoaning the amount of injuries the squad had when he first joined the club, but is now glad he can field an almost fully fit squad. The Iron were in the bottom three when he took charge, but are now climbing League One and are just six points from a playoff place. I think it's important that at times you, um, you give yourself, a, you want as many players uh, as possible that are fit and eligible to play in the game and, and uh, we're getting there. You know, we, when I first came in there were 10 and 11, 12 injuries. The, 12th, the 20th Super League season, now comprising of 12 teams including local sides Hull FC and Hull KR, kicks off this weekend. Hull FC are on their travels as they face the Huddersfield Giants whilst KR host Leeds Rhinos at Craven Park. The competition started last night as the Widnes Vikings and Wigan Warriors played out a thrilling 22-all draw. And that's all for the spot. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, Al, just to remind us, where can people get this book? So, if you use your search engine of your choice, uh, please just Google Alistair Wilkinson Suspended and you'll be able to buy either an electronic version much, or Dan. a hard copy. Uh, uh, if you have a story for us, please go to our Facebook or Twitter pages. Details on the screen, emails at estuary.tv or phone. And this is the right number, Grimsby 31553. Uh, and we'll be back next week on Monday. Until then, good evening. Hello and welcome to Estuary TV's weather. A mainly dry Saturday is expected, but with large amounts of cloud, bright or sunny spells may be limited. Winds light, but perhaps freshening a little by evening, maximum temperature of 6 degrees. Sunday mostly cloudy, with a few sunny spells and a slight chance of rain.